Good morning. Can you hear me? OK, good. So Giovanni, thank you very much for, for this introduction. And I should disappoint you, because I will not say everything about neutrinos. You see, this is very modest title of, uh, of my lectures. Uh, uh, but uh, in re reality, this is a vast field. And so what I will do, I will just cover some selected topics in neutrino physics. And I'm sure that if you invite some other speaker, you will get probably substantially different course of the lectures. This is fine. So I will speak on the things which I think I understand better than others. Uh, now, let me ask you first, uh, how many of you are really working in neutrino physics? Can you raise your hands just to see percentage? Because I'm also thinking that uh, how to do these lectures uh, uh, useful for everybody. And the point is I have selected topics um, which actually have kind of general value. So you may uh, meet such a situation in some other fields uh, and areas. And also, I want to stress some open questions. I think for you, it is very important to understand what are uh, the most kind of hot subjects in this field and what are uh, open questions and problems, because some of you are still looking for topics of your research. So this is my goal. I don't know if I will succeed or not. Um, so I will start with just reminding what uh, neutrinos are. Actually, I was supposed that it will be first lecture on standard model and uh, uh, by Peskin, so it would be some kind of introduction to what I'm going to speak. Uh, but uh, let me still remind. So what are neutrinos? Neutrinos are neutral, and they have uh, zero electric charge, and they have uh, zero QCD charge. So they are extremely light. So they are much lighter than uh, the mass of the electron, much lighter than uh, the proton. And uh, of course, the first temptation is somehow to connect these properties. And the first one is unique for known uh, fermions. So neutrino is the only fermion which has known fermion which has such a properties, uh, zero charges, zero conserved charges. And so many developments in neutrino physics are based on this property of neutrino. Uh, neutrino have accordingly only weak and gravitational interactions, so they are very elusive. And essentially, they are kind of eternal stra uh, strangers, because uh, uh, what happens once produced, especially at low energies, neutrinos travel forever, essentially, with very little chance to interact somewhere. This is bad, of course, for our detections, but this is good because neutrinos bring some uh, very important and uh, uh, unique information about the universe, about properties of particles, about everything. So neutrino is particle with spin one half. And so this is the most uh, abundant component of the universe, and neutrinos are everywhere. Actually, if sterile neutrinos exist, the number of neutrinos in the universe is even uh, bigger than the number of photons. Neutrinos play a special role not only in construction of the standard model, actually, they played a crucial role in this, but they also play a special and not completely understood role in evolution of the universe, being probably connected to dark sector, dark matter, and dark energy. So in this sense, neutrinos provide a portal to this hidden sector, very important, and many kind of developments related to this. Actually, it's interesting, you know. Uh, so we have many problems in our visible sector, but we are trying now to solve it in a hidden one. So this is the status of the field in one glance. There are many sources of neutrinos, the sun, atmosphere, the earth. Uh, then we have detected neutrino from supernova 87A and expecting some more bursts from supernovas. Neutrinos from cosmic rays or cosmic neutrinos. This is highlight. This is something which has been discovered very recently, and a number of developments are related to uh, this discovery. The universe, of course, is the source of neutrinos. Neutrinos are around us, and we more or less know that they are around us. Now, there are uh, various artificial sources of neutrino beams, accelerators, reactors, uh, and radiative sources. So we have plenty of the data on neutrinos. 
And it seems that they are, are quite well described in so-called three neutrino paradigm with massive neutrino. So what is this? We have standard model. And we have three neutrinos with masses and mixing. And uh, so with quite peculiar though properties of mixing and very small masses, which is something special about neutrino. And then the question which we ask, is this, th that's it? If there is something else on the top of this, up to say Planck scale, and this question is still open, it's interesting to, of course, to discuss. Now, uh, of course, one can introduce neutrino masses in a very gentle way, because neutrino masses are supposed something which is beyond the standard model. However, you can produce, introduce neutrino masses, generate without a, a strong perturbation of the rest of the theory. Uh, this is so-called famous uh, dimension five Weinberg operator, which produces the generates uh, Majorana masses of neutrinos. And here is some scale at which such an interaction is generated. Of course, it is not present in the standard model, but you can introduce on the top of the standard model this introduction. One thing actually tells us that maybe this is not the end of the story is that this lambda is actually should be much smaller than Planck scale mass, which indicates that there is something still between electroweak scale and the Planck scale. And I will speak about this in probably the last lecture. So neutrino masses are considered as some physics beyond the standard model. Actually, understanding of masses of uh, other particles, other fermions, uh, quarks and leptons, is also somehow physics beyond the standard model. We do not understand pattern of the masses. We don't know how hierarchy is produced. Of course, we can embed in the standard model. So we can describe masses of uh, quarks and leptons, but we do not understand particular pattern of the masses which we see and mixing also. So this is highlight, I mentioned already, this is detection of, uh, uh, of uh, cosmic neutrinos of high energies. And these are two first events detected actually uh, uh, almost three years ago uh, in PEV range. Who knows what is PEV? So TEV is, uh, you know, it's TEV is uh, LHC, right? So this is PEV, a thousand times more. And there were two events, first events, which were identified as something which cannot be explained by just the common uh, origins like atmospheric neutrino fluxes. And uh, now there are 37 events, and there is very interesting development in this area. Now, neutrino masses are related to some new physics, which we should identify. The question, what is this new physics? You know, we were waiting for many, many years finally to discover finite mass of neutrino and mixing. But unfortunately, till now, we cannot identify what is really this new physics behind neutrino masses and mixing. And the first question you ask is, what is the scale of neutrino mass generation? And you see, now we have so many possibilities which cover 20 order, eight orders of magnitude, starting from even electron volt or sub-electron volt scale and there are kind of interesting developments. Maybe we are looking in the wrong place what is the origin of neutrino masses. Maybe very light scale, or mass scale, energy scale, is somehow fundamental. And maybe neutrinos, and maybe dark energy, indicates toward this possibility. So this is quite something interesting which actually under development. Another important scale is, of course, electroweak and LHC scale. Um, and here, there's a lot of activity. I will uh, uh, cover something in, in, at the end of the course. And this is, for me, something like looking under the lamp. So it's just because we know that uh, these energies are available, and then we try to test everything what we can test at these energies. There is some sense, of course. Neutrinos have small masses. And uh, one of the ways to explain this is to assume that they are generated radiatively. And if you generate them radiatively, so the smallness is somehow related to some small Yukawa couplings or some other couplings. And therefore, from this point of view, there is sense, of course, to uh, search for uh, uh, some new particles or some new physics at a TEV scale associated to neutrino mass generation. And uh, actually, many things in between can be filled in. Uh, let me mention the, the last one. Uh, so this grand unification and Planck scale masses. 
And actually, neutrino masses indicate toward this scale because you can generate after electroweak scale squared over the mass of neutrino some new uh, characteristics of the dimension, the mass, right? So, and what is interesting that this is something like 10 to the 14, 10 to the 16 GeVs. And if actually, if you introduce three right-handed neutrinos in addition to what we have in the standard model and use CSO mechanism, which I will discuss later, then one of these right-handed neutrinos can be easily at precisely grand unification scale. So for me, it's some hint that uh, neutrino smallness of neutrino mass indicate toward the scale. And actually, Planck scale can also be involved in generation of neutrino masses. So 28 orders of magnitude means that we really have no uh, good uh, kind of glue to what happens with neutrino masses and what is the generation of the neutrino mass mechanism. Now, concerning mixing, we have quite an interesting pattern of uh, lepton mixing, and the ideas span from symmetry uh, down to anarchy and randomness especially after recent discovery of non-zero value of one three mixing. So uh, finally, for many, many years, actually, the driving force in developments of the field was so-called anomalies. So we had solar neutrino anomaly, atmospheric neutrino anomaly, which boiled up eventually to discovery of neutrino masses and mixing. So what are anomalies now we are discussing? And here you see a few. This is the old one, some result, which I will discuss, LSND, uh, then mini boon result, then reactor neutrino results, gallium uh, calibration results, solar neutrino spectrum, which indicate that maybe there is something beyond this three neutrino paradigm. I will discuss this in details later. Some anomalies disappear, some kind of produce eventually important results. And uh, you see, uh, it looks like a sterile neutrino is a, a solution of uh, all our existing problem. Sterile neutrino or something from hidden sector, because sterile neutrinos are the particles which uh, have no usual uh, interactions, and so, so they do not interact with photons, W bosons, uh, gluons and therefore can be considered as something which is in this hidden sector. Now, so uh, keeping all this in mind, I have selected the following topics of my lectures. I will discuss first the theory of propagation. And I think this has a, a general value. And you will see, I will use actually these results uh, during all these four lectures. And this is something which you can, you know, it's not just uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, assumptions or something like, uh, invoked something, uh, uh, specific, some uh, uh, unrelated to realities. This, we know this exists. So you will not waste your time at least listening to this. You may waste your time listening about models of neutrino mass and mixing, and most probably you will waste your time because there are thousands of models and probably only one is true, so I can imagine. And people are now doing classifications of these models, you know, that's some kind of uh, zoo of, of the theories. So I would, I would say that from theoretical point of view, so what, what is the theory of neutrino masses? So we have ground, and this is something which is solid, and then there is a lot of speculation. It's something like, like for me, it's neutrino physics looks like this. So this is solid stuff, and these are speculations. So this one is solid. Then I will discuss phenomenology and the way we are determining uh, neutrino parameters. And I will also discuss what are kind of uh, hot topics here, because now we are thinking how to determine neutrino mass hierarchy and CP violation in the leptonic sector. So there are, these are hot uh, topics in, in this subject. Then it will be more speculative toward understanding of neutrino mass and mixing. What I will try to do, I will here to use some kind of bottom-up approach, trying to analyze information which we have, and uh, try to see what are hints, what are kind of inferences from what we have observed. Keeping in mind this kind of disastrous situation when we have 28 orders of magnitude uh, unknown 
uh, scales for new physics and also this kind of uh, big uh, span of possibilities in explanation of mixing. And finally, I will discuss something which is beyond uh, three neutrino paradigm, and I will speak on sterile neutrinos. Questions? Okay, so masses mixing and the theory of propagation. We have three neutrinos, electron, muon, and tau, which we are identifying as uh, neutrino flavor states. They uh, correspond to certain charge current uh, interactions, or, and they are associated with certain charge current leptons. Electron neutrino with uh, electron, muon neutrino with muon, tau neutrino with tau lepton. Flavor is characteristic of interactions. So for instance, in neutron decay, we produce electron antineutrino together with electron. In pi and decay, mostly we are producing muon neutrino together with muon. Apart from uh, flavor states, we introduce mass states, the states which have definite masses, nu1, nu2, and nu3. So sometimes we call this uh, mass eigenstates. And the essence of mixing is that flavor states do not coincide with mass states. Flavor states are combinations of mass states, and vice versa. Mass states have kind of composite flavor. So in the standard model, as we know, not much to say that uh, uh, electron neutrino and electron form uh, electroweak doublet and the same is for uh, two other generations. The only what I want to say is that actually phenomenological definition which I gave uh, in the previous slide may differ from this theoretical one. And the point is when I'm saying, oh, if I have in some process appearance of electron and neutrino, then neutrino state which accompanies is electron neutrino. Now, imagine that um, Electron neutrino has some admixture of some heavy states, which actually in CISO mechanism this is the case, and in many recent developments this is also the case. This means if you have this heavy state, what you produce in weak decays is not this electron neutrino, but only part of the state, because heavy fermion, heavy lepton cannot be produced just kinematically. Okay. So the state which you are producing in, at low energies, for instance in beta decay, may differ from the state which you put in this charge current, in this doublet or in charge current. So that electron, electron neutrino can be the sum of, let me put here, u a i nu i plus, for instance, u e4 nu 4. And the mass of this four state can be quite large. It can be at electric scale, for instance. And so, of course, you cannot produce this state in a beta decay. What are you, you are producing? is this one, only this part. There are some interesting effects related to such a possibility. For instance, the state which you are producing here is not orthogonal to muon neutrino. And therefore, you may see some lepton number violating effects related to such a, a admixture of heavy state. Of course, this mixing is, should be quite small. Actually, the bound on this mixing is below 0.1 or maybe even less, 0 0.05. So it's small effect, but we are in the era of precision measurements, and so what happens that you produce only part of electron neutrino state, and it is not orthogonal to muon neutrino. This complete combination is uh, actually orthogonal to new mu, 
but not part. And uh, the overlap of new mu and produced new E at low energies will be determined by this admixture. I may elaborate on this a little bit later. Now, mixing, how we describe mixing? What you see here, actually what you see here, you can use to explain almost everything. I mean, it's just enough to stay with this diagram and explain all the neutrino physics and masses and mixing using this diagram. So you see here the mass spectrum of three neutrinos. So this is the mass scale. And uh, these boxes correspond to different mass states. Okay? Now, since we have mixing that mass states do not coincide with uh, flavor states, and they are combinations of different flavor states. And this you see by these colored boxes. The red color corresponds to new E, uh, green one to new mu, and uh, blue to new tau. And actually, I proposed this type of description long, long time ago, but now people are using different colors. So everybody uses its own color. Sometimes muon flavor is red. You know, some arguing, okay, not electron neutrino should be green or something like this. So this is original, but I, 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 other are just interpretations. Anyway, so what is the meaning of this? Suppose you have beam of neutrino nu1. This is kind of Gedanken experiment. I mean, it's this question, how can you produce this beam of neutrino one? And then you explore how this new one state interacts in your detector. And then what you see that in, say, two-thirds of the cases, in the length is uh, two-thirds here, it interacts as electron neutrino, producing electrons. In one-six of the cases, it will interact as muon neutrino. And in one six approximately cases as a tau neutrino. So the size of this box, if everything is just one, then the size of this box gives the probability to find in a given mass state, a given flavor state. So if you have this beam nu one, then it will produce both electrons and muons and also tau in this proportion. This is the essence of of the mixing. Of course, if you have just uh, one neutrino, then that gives you the probability. However, if you have many neutrinos flux, then uh, these uh, sizes give the portion of the number of muons, electrons, and tau you will uh, observe in interactions of this beam. Now, you can see here quite interesting pattern, right? It's not just uh, uh, something which is random. But first of all, uh, you see the mixing is not small. Small mixing would mean that uh, a given mass state is completely almost like has the same color, all, all the, uh, one color, right? So here you see that the mixture of different uh, here flavors in a given mass state is kind of comparable. It's not small. The only small is this. This is this famous 1-3 mixing, which is something like the size of this is uh, uh, something like 2%. The rest is quite big. Now you see here, it's almost like half and half, which we call maximal mixing. So if you have half and half mixing. So another pattern here is you have one third, one third, and one third here. It's also interesting. That gives you some idea that maybe some symmetry is behind this. It looks like Klebsch Gordon coefficients, right? So it's, uh, it's not like in quark seconds. This, uh, this is something interesting, and I will discuss. Uh, this later, I think in the, in the, in the third lecture. So uh, what else you can see here? Apart from, ah, so let me say, so how we describe this? So we have three flavor states and three mass states, and uh, so this is the matrix, mixing matrix which connects flavor and mass states. And moduli squared of elements of this matrix give precisely the sizes of these boxes. Okay, and I have uh, uh, written here, for instance, that the size of this box is just U, E, 1, moduli square. And the rest you can read also here. So we have this PMNS matrix, which is three by three complex matrix. And we also parameterize this uh, in terms of three mixing angles. So let me define how this mixing angles are introduced. We introduce one, two mixing angle. 
which actually gives the ratio of uh, this red part, so this red part and this one. So it gives you relative contributions of electron flavor in the second and the third state. One three mixing angle, sine squared theta one three, is just precisely give this small uh, uh, red part. And now two three mixing, tangent squared theta two three, describes distribution of muon and tau flavor in the heaviest state. So if amount of muon and tau flavor is the same, then the tangent squared theta two three is one. This is maximal mixing. This matrix also has some complex phases. Actually, there's only one complex phase which is feasible, which is kind of has a physical meaning in oscillation experiments. Actually, altogether, there are three phases which have uh, physical meaning. And two uh, exist if neutrinos are Majorana particles. So if neutrino is Dirac, then only one phase uh, exists. This is so-called CP violation phase. And it is analogy with what we have in quark sector. Changes of CP violation phase actually affect distribution of muon and tau flavor here and also here. So if you change phase delta, and this picture is for phase delta zero, then you have slight changes of borders here. Usually we are parameterizing this mixing matrix in this way. So there are three rotations, one, two, one, three, and two, three. And here is the matrix of complex phases. I will show you in the next slide. Um, and it is important, this is so-called standard param parameterization. It is important, this very convenient parameterization. So mostly we are using this parameterization. And this is very uh, easy to use this when you discuss propagation of neutrinos. So that, yes, so we haven't measured these phases and the measurement of this phase delta, actually here is this uh, uh, matrix, which is diagonal matrix of this type. Uh, so this is one of the major issues to measure this, uh, this CPU violation phase. Okay, so uh, microphone. The question is uh, how we measure these phases and what, uh, so what are, here I'm discussing, this is just Dirac, so-called Dirac phase. Now, if neutrino is Majorana, then there are two additional phases, which we are actually attaching from this side. And those will be, can be measured in double beta decay experiment. I will discuss this. Right. Right. All three phases enter this this expression. Yeah. In double beta decay, but this we can measure independently in oscillation experiments. And not only this, because of smallness of one three mixing, essentially double beta decay is sensitive to only one of these Majorana phases. So this is kind of explicit uh, form of this UPMNS matrix. And probably I should not say much, apart from you see the phase appears here in this one three element, and uh, the phases also appear here. And therefore you see this, uh, uh, these elements are affected by the phase delta. Another po uh, important point is that this phase factor appears always with S13. This is important. Actually, if S13, 13 mixing angle, would be zero, then this phase is also has no physical meaning. You can just uh, remove it by rephasing. And therefore, due to 13 non zero mixing angle, this phase appears here and it's, uh, it has a physical sense. But all the effects are proportional also to S13 or S13 squared. So there's certain smallness here. Now, let me say a few words about uh, uh, how we get this uh, mixing. It's just more to fix uh, notations. So origin of the mixing is actually uh, inequality of mass matrices of charged leptons and neutrinos. And so what you are doing, you are diagonalizing these mass matrices. Uh, and that gives you the mixing, and that gives you the mass spectrum when you diagonalize these matrices. So here you see expressions for uh, charge left and mass matrix. In terms of diagonal, and these are the matrix of eigenvalues, which means the mass of electron, muon, and tau, and these are two mixing matrices. 
UL, left rotation, and this is a rotation of right-handed components. Now, this is mass matrix of neutrino, and if it is Majorana, it can be written in such a way. Again, we have here diagonal uh, uh, matrix, which is the matrix of mass eigenvalues, and there are two rotations. But here, if neutrino is Majorana, and Majorana mass term is organized by using just two components, only left-handed components and conjugate of left-handed components are involved. I will discuss this later in details. Uh, so you have the same matrix here and here on the left. Here is also a transponent matrix. And then uh, if you have charge current, which was written there, and you ex uh, insert in the charge current expressions in terms of mass states, you can write your charge current in this way, which is this is neutrino mass states. They are given here. Uh, this is uh, uh, electron, muon, and tau. And then you will get here this matrix UPMNS, which has such an expression. So what enters here, the left-handed rotation from diagonalization of charge left and mass matrix, and also left-handed rotation from diagonalization of neutrino mass matrix. So this is eventually what is PMNS matrix. I don't want to make this exercise. I think you can write this and repeat. I recommend to do this by yourself. Now, uh, we use very often flavor bases the basis in which uh, charge left and mass matrix is diagonal. So we call this flavor basis. And then in this case, uh, UPMNS matrix is just a left-handed rotation of, of neutrinos, given by diagonalization of neutrino mass matrix in this basis. Questions? To measure what from experiments? Well, it depends what you do. I mean, it depends on the experiment. So you are speaking about uh, mass eigenstates of charged leptons or neutrinos? Oh, so you see, it's very drastic difference. So the question is what, what we are us usually dealing in the experiment. And so what is interesting, that in contrast to quarks, where we deal with mass states, both up quarks and down quarks, and so we can easily, just using decays to measure, for instance, mixing angles, in contrast to these, neutrinos, because they are light, they are produced as a coherent state. And fortunately or unfortunately, this coherent state is just kept for, for, for a long time. So and therefore, here we measure mixing angle in a completely different way. So uh, in neutrino sector, we deal with flavor states, which are combinations of mass states. And uh, again, I was speaking about this Gedanken experiment. It would be easy in some, uh, to some extent if we would have beams of uh, uh, mass eigenstates. Wait, wait, wait. I, I just, uh. Yeah. So while we are talking about the bounds on this U E4, the mixing between electron and the say fourth generation neutrinos. So I understand that you cannot produce new four via beta decay interaction and you can make uh, the neutrinos that are produced in the beta decay to interact immediately with matter and see if any mu on uh, emits and that's how you can uh, determine that. But my question is that, does this bound on UE4 depends on your measurement of UE1, UE2, and UE3? So uh, you have to uh, give some inputs for UE1, UE2, and UE3 to extract a bound on UE4. So does the measurement of UE1 depends on the presence of UE4 or not? Yeah, so one way, of course, to measure, uh, if you know precisely these elements, if you measure, then you can use unitarity condition that the moduli, sum of moduli square of these plus this uh, uh, should be one. And so they, you can just subtract uh, from one moduli square of these elements, and then you get that. But usually we are using different method to measure this uh, 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 this angle, and for instance, as I mentioned already, in this case, muon neutrino and electron neutrino are uh, not orthogonal. So these type of the schemes produce some effects like uh, lepton number violation, like mu gamma, for instance. Or you can search for appearance of this uh, heavy uh, hypothetical, so we can just say hypothetical particle directly uh, from 
you can still produce uh, at LHC, for instance, and then see if uh, they are decaying in uh, visible particles. And actually, actually, my question is that, that does my measurement of UE1 depends on the presence of UE4 or not? I mean, the experimental extraction of UE1. So if okay. I assume uh, fourth generation or if... Yes, it, it depends slightly. Yeah. That was my question, actually. So you cannot use unitarity then? So we are doing these uh, measurements very often just an assumption that there is a unitarity and only three, but you need to reanalyze again data if you assume this. And this also, there are some general considerations. It also affects uh, 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 oscillation pattern. Thanks. OK. So uh, as I said, mixing has kind of a dual Meaning, you saw this spectrum. Now, suppose you produce electron neutrinos. What you are producing? You are producing something like is what is shown here. So you are producing not just one mass state, but a combination of mass states. And you see, mostly it will be new one, but uh, one third will be uh, new two, and then a little bit new three. So when we are saying that we are producing electron neutrino, means that we are producing a combination of uh, of mass states, uh, similarly from for new mu and new tau. Now the question, which is quite non-trivial, so who mixes this neutrino? Why we have this? Why we have still the fluxes of electron, muon, and tau neutrino? And the answer is actually not very trivial, and it is somehow non-trivial interplay of charge current weak interactions and some kinematical properties of certain reactions. For instance, in neutron decay or in beta decays of nuclei, we are producing electron antineutrino just because we cannot produce muon and we cannot produce tau by kinematic reasons, because energy release in beta decay is something like few MeVs. And muon and tau leptons have much bigger masses, so we just do not produce them. Otherwise, if you would have mass split between neutron and proton very big, say, GeVs or, I don't know, 100 GeVs, then we would produce all three neutrino species. And then it will be quite non-trivial to figure out what is, uh, what is what. In the case of pi decay, it's different reason. In pi and decay, we mostly produce muon neutrino. So, so pi and pi and decay, we mix other, we produce other combination of mass state. And the reason is because of chirality suppression. Just angular momentum conservation tells us that it should be a flip of helicity. So you have here pi, and then you produce muon, and you produce muon, and you produce neutrino. Uh, so, to satisfy angular momentum conservation, you should have a flip here of, of helicity. And this flip is proportional to the mass of the lepton. In this case, mass of the muon. For the decay into electron and electron neutrino, you need to flip the helicity of electron. And this mass is much smaller, and therefore, this mode dominates, and the mode of decay into electron and uh, electron neutrino is suppressed by four orders of magnitude. Also, there are some features when we can uh, 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 in enhance appearance of tau lepton. Now, what about neutral current? So what, what, is what is produced in decay in the case of decay of Z0? So who tell me? So, can we do something about this? So what is produced if you have Z0 decay? So what is the state of neutrino and antineutrino which is produced here? Is it electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino, or what? What, say? All of them. Okay, so um, all of them in the same uh, kind of amount, right? But, but you see, Z0 has no sensitivity to flavor. So what is really state? Which is from, maybe it's just mass states, M1, uh, new one, new, uh, new one bar, new two, new two bar, new three, new three bar. 
because Z0 doesn't understand what is flavor. So which combination of the states, and what is this? Is this combination which is a kind of an incoherent sum of the three channels, or what? Any guesses? Okay, I'll give you an answer later, but uh, let us proceed further. But it's a kind of interesting physics, it's somehow related to Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen paradox. And uh, the answer here that you produce all three neutrino types of neutrinos, and the state which you are producing is coherent sum of the states of three neutrinos. It's not just you are separating, you have new E, new E bar channel independently, new mu, new, new mu bar channel, and new tau, new tau bar. No, you are producing some sum of this, coherent sum of this. Then you can wonder how we get correct number of neutrino species, three in Z0 decay. But it turns out that even if you consider this kind of coherent sum, it still produces three neutrino species in the uh, decay rate of Z0. So what I will discuss uh, in some details, and I think it's uh, uh, important to understand, is uh, this uh, oscillation or theory of oscillations and uh, adiabatic conversion. And in fact, all, all the data which we have for time being can be understood using these two processes. So using the data from all these experiments and uh, uh, these uh, two types of the processes, we can extract neutrino parameters. Now oscillations, what is oscillations? Oscillations are periodic process of transformation of one neutrino species into another one. So you produce muon neutrino and then periodically uh, in the course of uh, propagation it transforms to uh, electron neutrino and then it's periodic process. It's after some time and distance it is going back to elect muon neutrino and this is uh, kind of lasts for a while. Oscillations were kind of proposed uh, many years ago, actually 50 years ago, uh, 58 years ago by Bruno Ponte Corvo, who has this uh, paper, Misonium and Antimisonium. Um, but and in some last uh, part, in one paragraph, he mentioned uh, uh, neutrino oscillations. And um, what he was saying actually was trying to find some objects which are knowledge of K0, K0 bar. K0, K0 bar were known by that time. People discuss oscillations uh, between them and then Ponte Coro said, so maybe we, uh, there are some other systems which have the same behavior. And he discussed uh, this muon, muon, uh, anti-muon system. Now he said that, okay, oscillations uh, imply non-zero masses or mass square differences and mixing that also was mentioned. Well, actually, this is a very subtle point. Are we sure that oscillations require non-zero masses? And one should remember one thing, actually. This is something which you need finally to test very well in experiment. What we observe in oscillation, but mostly I will speak about masses. But I just want to warn you, and so you will may ask uh, further questions. Actually, what we are testing in oscillations are not directly masses. We are testing dispersion relations. Whatever change dispersion relation, that is relation between energy and momentum of your system, can influence oscillations and actually can lead to oscillations. In oscillations, in usual case, they have no direct sensitivity to masses, and mass is something which flip helicity. In oscillation, there is no flip of helicity. So left-handed neutrinos are left-handed neutrinos, they are not flipping helicity. This is irrelevant, and therefore, in oscillations, we are not testing immediately this nature of mass, okay? So something which can fake the mass will also produce oscillations. It can be just interaction. So, and actually, famous paper by Wolfenstein, he actually uh, have written this paper trying to get oscillations without masses. I will mention this later. So this is uh, what I put the question, and let me make some some comment. What is interesting that uh, proposal of neutrino oscillations was motivated by rumors about wrong results, actually. So this interesting uh, fact in history. Sometimes even wrong results can produce something which is very beautiful and correct. So 
in that epoch, it was Davis' experiment. Davis is famous by his uh, measurements of solar neutrino fluxes. But what he has started, he produced this uh, uh, chlorine detector. Actually, it was also suggested by Bruno Ponte Corva. And then what he did, he just put it close to atomic reactor. And to see if he sees some signal or not. What is important that this experiment is sensitive only to electron neutrinos and not electron antineutrinos. Sun produces electron neutrinos. Uh, reactors produce mostly electron antineutrinos. So you do not expect any signal effect from reactor neutrino beam. And uh, in the first series of the experiments, he saw some excess of events which could be interpreted that uh, something happens, and he actually detects electron neutrinos. And then Bruno Ponte Corva start to thought, oh, maybe antineutrinos produced in the reactor actually flip on the way to neutrinos. And that caused the effect in Davis' experiment. So this is why he started, and the first his suggestion was neutrino-antineutrino oscillations. Not what we are discussing now, flavor oscillations. And the first proposal was neutrino-antineutrino oscillation. So uh, eventually it was realized that uh, the effect is just some background, and uh, Nothing has been officially published, but the rest was this comment in, in Ponte Corvo paper. It was like, you know, when some towns were just uh, start to organize, it was written, so this town has been mentioned, you know, in the 11th century, blah, blah, blah. It was like here, so historical. It was not much development between this suggestion and uh, re eventually this boom of studies of neutrino oscillations. So what we have now, now we have many observations of oscillations. Results are well described by standard oscillation formula. Uh, in the literature, there is very na naive derivation of this oscillation formula, uh, essentially a few lines. And probably you have studied also this uh, using uh, textbooks where just few lines. And then you realize that something is wrong with this derivation. And uh, you immediately realize some paradoxes. And then you start to write the papers. Because you say, okay, so I know better than so it's, it's absolutely wrong, and so uh, I, I, I want to derive correct oscillation formula. So in still, I'm kind of referring every year a few papers with kind of new theory of neutrino oscillations with some corrections to the theory of neutrino oscillations. So I hope no one of you will write after my lectures uh, such a papers. So the point is that derivation is oversimplified. It's over, it, it gives correct result. Actually, it's interesting why it gives correct result even. This is why people are wondering. So, but it's really oversimplified. The point is that things are a bit more complicated and to some extent quite interesting. But in most of the situations, what we uh, deal with and in experiments, uh, actually things are very much simplified. And you come to this very simple naive formula. But conceptually, conceptually, it's important to pass through this more correct way to understand what is behind of the final result. Actually, who has derived oscillation formulas for oscillation probability? Some? You are not counted. You are senior. <laughs> So what, what I want to do, actually, I will, I will immediately derive kind of in the way I think, I mean, somebody may object, is correct way, the simplest. Also, one can use complete field theory to, to do this derivation, but I will, I will derive and you please follow. I think that that's uh, uh, what I, I want you to keep home after, after these lectures. So there's some reference list which uh, uh, I'm, I'm, it's my, my kind of uh, analysis is based on. Uh, so in principle, it should be no problem, right? We have Lagrangian. We have these charge current interactions, right? So W boson, this is uh, uh, lepton, this is uh, neutrino plus Hermitian conjugate, and we have mass terms for neutrinos. Again, I'm using here Majorana neutrino. Therefore, this is the same left state. And this is uh, masses, mass of, uh, of charged lepton. And then we know all this machinery of quantum field theory. So what's the problem? You just use this Lagrangian and do what you want to do. So in principle, theory should give you correct answer. So we use quantum field theory or even quantum mechanics sometimes. It's this enough to compute uh, amplitudes, probabilities of the process, and eventually ob uh, observables, numbers of events in different experiments. 
Well, actually, if you do this, then things become not very simple. And here, what is interesting, we deal with quantum mechanics at microscopic distances. So for instance, you can stay within the wave packet. You know, and you may have Feynman diagram, which is two kilometers long, you know. You produce neutrino, and then you have propagator of neutrino, which is uh, two kilometers long, or maybe 10 kilometers long. So it's kind of interesting and fascinating subject. So the point is that even if you know the field theory, right, still your setup should be adjusted to particular physical problems. Usually, we deal with computation of amplitudes of scattering. And usually, what we are saying, oh, at infinity, we have free particles which approach each other. And they interact in some interaction region. And then we see what is going out of this. And uh, so we can use then just plain waves describing particles in initial and final state. Right? So usually, say, interaction region is very small. You know, this is uh, 10 to the minus, say, 13 centimeters. And your particles approaching from, uh, from, say, several meters, it's already infinity, right? It's many, many, many orders of magnitude. Here, the situation is a bit different. And actually, here we deal with two regions of interaction. Source, production, region of neutrinos, and detector, detection region. And actually here, the oscillation is finite size process. And the result of oscillation depends on the distance between source and the detector. And that should be embedded already in your formalism. If you just do everything and go to infinities, you will lose in, uh, oscillations. So this is finite size and finite time process. And we have here two regions of interaction in contrast to, uh, uh, to, to scattering. Of course, you can probably consider only here external particles and here external particles. But then your formalism should know about localization of source and the detector. So what is this localization? You can actually embed localization in your quantum field theory or quantum mechanics formalism in two different ways. So in principle, you need to use wave functions of particles which participating in production of neutrinos. Suppose you have a neutron decay. Then you need to use neutron wave function, and not at infinity, but in your detector, with all these properties of the detector. OK? And it is this wave function which will localize production region of neutrinos, the source. The same is uh, detection. You need to use, again, wave functions. For instance, if scattering occurs on, on proton, then you need to explicitly write the wave function of proton and find this wave function. It depends on our distance. And it is this which gives you localization. So of course, you can use these wave packets for external particles, or you can explicitly make integration over finite regions. So this is another way, somehow approximate, but you can do two independent uh, uh, computations here and here. So in, in a sense, you can use uh, to apply this S matrix formalism twice for the region of production, for region of detection of neutrinos. And then you can, if you make this uh, kind of uh, finite space-time integration over production and detection regions, then you can use to some approximation plane waves also. Questions? You see the difference, right? So there's the difference. And you need to do with these bloody things with wave functions, because if you have plane waves, everything is fine. You know, you just make integration, you get de delta functions. So delta functions, delta functions. But here you need to make integration over this. You need to find these wave functions of particles accompanying neutrino. And then you can should compute integrals. And this is, you know, things become very complicated. Again, fortunately, you can do this in quite general way. And in many cases, uh, the results do not depend on particular shape of wave fu functions of your uh, particles.
So um, how will we treat neutrinos? Actually, we can treat neutrinos again in quantum field theory as just propagator between source and detection region. But if the distance is quite big, then uh, neutrinos are quite quickly become on the mass shell, with very, with very good approximation on the mass shell. And so you can actually truncate the process and consider independently production process, then uh, a propagation of neutrinos. And here you can use neutrinos just using as uh, a free particles, not just a propagator, but just uh, as particles on the mass shell. And then you can independently treat the process of uh, detection. Questions? You know, one, you can actually do everything even without introducing the notion of flavor states, which actually produce this hustle you need, you know, to do this, mis met, you know, various things, coherence, non-coherence. But you can do it in the following way. You can just work immediately with mass states, which are very useful, and because these mass states, they propagate independently, nothing happens with them, so you produce mass state and it propagates because this is eigenstate of Hamiltonian in vacuum. Right? So it's nice to work with eigenstates of Hamiltonian. Right? Nice. So because they just propagate independently, and then the only what you need, you need to see how they were produced and how they interact. And, and you need to compute these amplitudes and sum these amplitudes coherently. So to say, to sum amplitudes and then compute moduli square. I will tell you this more in more details. So uh, you can work again with mass eigenstates, which are this new I, and you have this charge current, and therefore you have here these interactions of uh, mass states with uh, charge leptons, and you can treat uh, this block, which is just your gauge coupling, and here is UPMNS matrix as interaction constant. So once you know these elements of PMNS matrix, you know this coupling constant, and so you can compute what are, uh, what is the probability or amplitude of probability to produce a given mass state of neutrino? I just work with mass states, that's it. And here is uh, how you produce, for instance, from pi, and again, you can compute immediately what is the amplitude of production of uh, mass states. And then to see how they, they propagate trivially, nothing happens, and then see how they interact in your detector. So, for this, you need to use wave packets of, of neutrinos, and usual setup is the following. This is in the approximation of factorization. If the region of production and detection are quite small, and you can neglect oscillations in the production and detection region, then you can truncate the, separate uh, three, uh, all the process in three parts. One is production, then oscillation and propagation of neutrinos and oscillations here, and then the detection. Okay, this is how we usually treat these things. And now this is some derivation which actually I will go slowly and probably will finish at, uh, uh, at this point. And I want you to understand how, what, what's going on. I could do this on the blackboard if you want, but let me just to uh, go step by step. Suppose we produce neutrino of the type alpha. Alpha can be electron, muon, or tau. And they are produced in the source, in some which, which is centered at x equals 0 and time equals 0. So after formation of the wave packet inside this production region, we get this state, which actually is the combination of mass states, nu k, right? So what enters in this form, this is summation over mass states, one, two, three. This is the element of PMNS matrix, right? Conjugate here. And this is the wave function of mass state. This is very general, right? This is kind of coupling of, uh, with which you produce a given state, mass state. Agree? And then wave function. And this is given by, uh, by, uh, by production process and properties of your source, right? So this you need to compute in general. Okay? Now, the wave function of a given mass state can be in general written in such a form. 
So this is wave packet. So it's kind of combination of plane waves. And this is what you see here. This is exponent. It's just plane wave. Right? And so this is what we call shape factor. If you want, you just do Fourier transform if you want. So f is the amplitude of probability to find plane wave with a given momentum, p. And p, k is the average momentum in a given wave packet. OK? Derivation is not very long. And don't, don't, don't worry. Why you tell me if, if something is not clear? So this is wave function of uh, individual uh, mass state. and. Um, uh, so we have this sum. Now here we have the energy. And the energy is uh, related to momentum in this way. It's just usual dispersion relation, right? We have mass eigenstate with mass k. And then the energy is given by this. And I have mentioned already this is uh, the momentum distribution function of the packet. And PK is the mean momentum in your wave packet. Wave packet is a combination of plane waves with different uh, momenta. Well, it's just usual standard quantum mechanics, nothing more. Agree? So now we are doing the following. Let us expand this uh, expression for energy, this one around the energy which corresponds to average momentum. So uh, we have a wave packet. This is P. Scale, and this is uh, this F. And this is PK. Actually, wave packet can be more complicated form. It can be even like this. For pi and decay, for instance, it's not uh, it's not Gaussian, it's more complicated thing. So what we will do is just, this is Taylor expansion, right? It's nothing. This is the first term, we just take this energy at momentum P, K. Then this is the second term. And here we have D, E, K over D, P. This is the third term, etc. We just do this trivial expansion of this expression. So this is nothing but expansion of this expression. Now, what is here? Here is first term is just energy which corresponds to averaged momentum in the packet. The second term is quite interesting, because here we, uh, we see dE over dP. And this is nothing but group velocity of your wave packet. OK? And group velocity is given by, uh, if you do this differentiation, it's just P over the energy. The third term is, has quite interesting also nature. The third term describes so-called spread of the wave packets. I will uh, explain a little bit later. So when you produce wave packet, what it, it does, it propagates, right? But it also spreads because of presence of different momenta in the wave packet. And so, for instance, wave packet from supernova, wave packet from supernova has the width 10 to the minus 11 centimeters. When it arrives from the center of the galaxy, for instance, to the Earth, it has the size 5 meters. Can you imagine? So that's, this is inflation, no, Paolo? This is something comparable. You know, how many folds or not? Well, it's interesting, and people haven't discussed this, but, but, uh, but there are kind of conceptual questions what to do with this spread. Usually, we are neglecting this spread, which may not be completely correct in all the cases. And if we neglect the spread, then our en expression for energy has uh, such a, uh, 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 they have just two terms. So the first one is uh, what we have at pk, and then and the second one, which is proportional to group velocity. Remember, this derivative of energy just gives you the group velocity. Now, inserting this expression for energy into our formula for the wave packet, for this, for, for this wave function. So we insert it here. Okay. We will get immediately this. 
So, so the terms which uh, we have no integration, we integrate over dp. So for instance, if we have here energy uh, of the k state, that uh, this term will, will go immediately out and some other. And so we will have here two factors. The first factor is the phase factor. So we can actually rewrite it in this way, where the phase of the k state is given just pk x minus e k time. And it depends on the uh, average or mean characteristic of your wave packet. This is also important. Okay? Now, the second term, again, everything comes from here when you make the substitution, can be written in such a way. So it's just given by, again, integral. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, fk, right, which is what's staying here. And uh, uh, this is, again, phase factor. This is what is left here, when you, what you cannot put out of the integral, right? Important property here is that uh, the uh, distance coordinate and the time enter in such a combination. It's x minus vk. This means that this factor describes propagation of your object with velocity vk, right? And we neglected change of the shape, also shape changes of the of wave packet. But we neglected for time being. So this is what we call shape factor. Shape factor should be computed uh, uh, using the process of the production. And it is process dependent. So let me give you the picture. And now we come to this picture, how we describe uh, uh, our states, propagating states, using this expression for, for, uh, for this, uh, what we got before, the product of, of uh, phase factors and shape factors. And since our state is combinational, here I use example with two mass eigenstates, then we have these two terms, with two different shape factors, uh, with two different group velocities, uh, with two different phases. And so this is how we describe our state, and here is a graphic representation. Suppose we produce electron neutrino. Then according to these two neutrino mixing formulas, just for simplification, uh, this electron neutrino is composed of two wave packet, two wave packets which correspond to the state nu1 and nu2. Okay. So the, uh, the amplitude here is uh, given by just cosine theta, and this is by sine theta, which enters in this mixing formula. Each of these eigenstates has composite flavor, as we decided, right? Once we have mixing, then, uh, then it should be composed of two different flavors. And you see here, red part, which is uh, uh, Electron flavor, green one is muon, and both packets com uh, uh, contain both muon and electron parts. And you can wonder, how come this is electron neutrino, but it has muon parts? And the point is that you see in muon neutrino, these two parts should be with opposite sign here. So they should actually uh, have opposite phases. Here they have the same phases. And therefore, these green parts which cancel each other. So it's destructive interference. If you produce electron neutrino, although they contain some uh, muon neutrino component, but these neutrino com muon neutrino components have opposite uh, sign and they, co and they cancel each other. Now, what's going when this uh, system start to propagate? What's going on is the following. In initial moment, the phase difference is zero. And uh, therefore, these green parts cancel each other, so you have just electron neutrino. But uh, uh, these uh, uh, wave packets, they will have different phase velocities because they have different masses. And therefore, phase here, F1, is not equal to F2 in general. They have different masses, and therefore, the phases will be different. And so phase difference will change from zero and start to increase. And therefore, in the already next moment of time, you will have no complete cancellation of these green parts. And so this means that you will see appearance of muon neutrino in your originally produced electron neutrino flux. And those are the oscillations. 
So the oscillations are just the process of the phase difference change between these two wave packets. I will, I'm about to finish this and let me just uh, uh, summarize some things. So when you have this propagation of the wave packets, few things happen. The phase difference changes, the phase difference between mass states, and that produces oscillation. Then what happens is that wave packets start to separate because they have also different group velocities because of difference of masses. And so if you have first overlap of the wave packets, then they start to separate from each other. And the third, there is a spread of individual wave packets. So and I will continue next lecture. <laughs>